Rinku Sen, wow. <laughs> I think we have a new mission statement, too busy for bullshit. <laughs> as pioneers, we've long known that the solutions to our environmental and social crises are largely present, or we know what directions to head in. Yet the voices of our mass media and culture have obsessively remained focused on what Paul Hawken calls catastrophizing the future. We seem to be far better at imagining catastrophic road warrior futures than scenarios with happy endings. In truth, the future may well depend on whether humanity can imagine these happy endings. Once people grasp the abundance of practical and visionary solutions, it, and the, the fact that each of us can truly do something about that, it dramatically leverages the direction of change. After all, reality is consensual. Dreaming the future can create the future. You may have no idea how to get there, but somehow, with a vision, you make the impossible inevitable. Paul Hawken has a gift for making the impossible inevitable. His far-seeing vision generates the field that brings us joyfully into that dream. One of the signs of Paul's genius is his ability to take mind-numbingly complex systems and information and distill them into pure quintessence, into simplicity itself. Another sign is his ability to find and question our most basic assumptions, to actually see the water that we swim in and ride the currents that can take us where we want and need to go. His newest enterprise, Project Drawdown, reflects that genius. He began by questioning the assumption that we're condemned to live with catastrophic levels of CO2 concentrations. After all, why can't we emulate nature and draw those concentrations back down to pre-industrial levels? If that's our dream, how do we find the currents to take us there? Project Drawdown reflects the convergence of the many streams of Paul's flow into what's likely to be a world-changing rushing river. It provides a compass and a toolkit to navigate the global transition to clean energy, a healthy biosphere, and a just world. These streams converge from Paul's youthful involvement in the civil rights um, struggles of the 1960s to his founding of the groundbreaking natural food companies in the earliest years of the movement. From his environmental and social justice activism to his pathfinding approach to ethical business, founding of several iconic companies, and authoring of landmark books such as The Ecology of Commerce and Natural Capitalism. From his um, landmark book, Blessed Unrest, that brought to light and helped amplify this rising global movement of movements that we're all part of and which, in which we saw ourselves, to his current visionary entrepreneurship in green chemistry and clean energy. Paul sees around corners, and he does it with an astonishingly centered, relaxed composure, wisdom, and charm. In a world longing for good news and real solutions, Paul's providing a hopeful, unifying vision that combines scientific river, rigor, excuse me, astute alliance building, the soul of a poet, and the heart of a lion. Please join me in welcoming one of our great visionaries, mentors, brothers, and friends with just-in-time delivery of a project that is truly epic. Paul Hawken. Are the most generous audience in the world. It's the only time you can go out and get a standing ovation before you've said anything. <laughs> Let's see if I get two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I want to share something. I, went, I, I woke up this morning. This is like just off. I, and yesterday I was here. I knew what I wanted to say to you. And I woke up this morning and I was locked out of my speech. I, it's, I don't know if you have ever had this experience where <laughs> you kind of know what you're going to say, and then at some point, you, it's, it goes blank. You can't get in. It's like a tent or a building, or you've locked out of your car, and the key's inside on the front seat. <laughs> and so, like Rinko, I went for a run in the forest. I thought, well, my door's in the forest. You know? And it was so beautiful, and I found a new door. And um, so grateful to my forest and the water that's in it, what little water that's dribbling down the creek. 
Um, I want to start by asking you a question, and that is, how many of you don't believe in climate change? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Okay. Now, the thing to notice about that question is two things. That's a trick question. It's a total trick question. All of you should raise your hand. And the reason is, first of all, it's not climate change, it's climate disruption. Climate change is a Republican word that was inserted into the media to tamp down concern. Second, science is not a belief system. The people who believe are the deniers who think that this climatic stability that we've had for 10,000 years in the Holocene period will continue for another few centuries to come. And there's not one shred of evidence to support that belief. So the faith-based system is entirely on the side of the deniers. We don't believe in climate science, believe in climate change. We actually are scientists, all of us. We support science. The IPCC, fifth assessment, is supported by two billion data points. Two billion data points. 2,500 scientists. There's not one funder. They're funded from national science agencies and colleges and universities and institutes. It is the most extraordinary scientific endeavor ever undertaken by humankind. There's no second, third, or fourth place. So this is what we stand on, right? So the problem is how we communicate it. And the communication has been really poor. Per Espen Stokeness, a, a, a Norwegian psychologist, wrote a book called What Do We Think About When We're Not Thinking About Climate Change? And it's a really wonderful book about the psychological barriers to communicating about climate change. And obviously, they are manifest and mul multiple because we're not doing a good job about it. They really involve distance, doom, dis uh, dissonance, uh, and, and there's a kind of a passivity that comes from all this. And, and distances, reports that come out and say, you know, in the year 2100, Miami will be, you know, it'll be two feet higher, the ocean in Miami and New Orleans, you go, cool. Like, I mean, it just doesn't ring true for most people. And actually, a lot of people think, well, that's not such a bad idea, you know. And <laughs> it, it, it doesn't come home when it's that far out in time. And the second thing we do is we catastrophize the future, as Kenny said. We go out with doom. 80, for every, uh, uh, like, 80 articles that come out about climate change, 78 or 79 are about, we're, get, we're screwed. What's going wrong? And one of them, or two, can be about opportunity, but that opportunity often is sort of delusional. And, and so that's another way we're communicating. It doesn't really work because fear produces passivity, numbness, and it turns people off, okay? And then there's dissonance, which is like, I need to go to the gas station where I live to get the Bioneers to give this talk, and I can't ride my bike, because if you ride a bike from Southern Marin to here, it's, it's impossible. There is not a good way to get here from there. And they're all Chevron stations. <laughs> so I go to the one that's owned by a Korean and has an African-American mechanic because they're so sweet and they're real people and they're actually family owned. The rest of them, I don't know who owns them. But it's the dissonance. Like, I know what I'm doing. I'm combusting fossil fuels. And we all have that, right? And, but the most important one is really about identity. And I want to show you something. I want to ask you another question, which is, if we put, and I'll just put this on right next. Let's see if I can, yeah, OK, a sphere, the Earth. If we, I want you to imagine us, 7.3 billion people, as a sphere. That's a sphere. How, how big would it be, be, the diameter? Texas, Boston, Island of Hawaii. Just imagine a, 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 you know, a diameter. How big would we be? You know? Huh? Miles. Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, I mean, the, we'll have lots of ideas about what it could be, right? Because we're just imagining, like we have a sense of scale, right? So I want to show you uh, how big it is. Uh, can't see it yet. Uh, still can't see him. This is all of us. This is the biggest giant cuddle we've ever had. There's. <laughs> There's no airspace between the 7.3 billion people in this biomass, okay? And well, we're still not there, but we're coming. 
Uh, nope, not there. Uh, nope. Uh, there, there we are, right there. That's it. What? What? Exactly. Exactly. What? It's like, you can still, there we go. You can see it right there, right? Right there. Still can't see it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, right here. Right here on the fairgrounds. Right here. I know, see, and I'm looking at your faces, you're going, ah, oh, Paul, oh, you know. And, <laughs> and, and, okay. So I did this at Pratt Whitney, which is, you know, they make jet engines keep us up in the air. And this sphere covered, well, actually was enclosed by their factory grounds and the and big factory. And so a guy came up to me after my presentation. He said, Paul, great presentation, great graphics. You know, he said, too bad you got the math wrong. And I said, did you do the math? He said, no. This is the math, OK? And the, this is my point, which is when we have a strongly held belief, facts don't change that belief. In 2007, a journalist wrote a piece that there was, we discovered underwater bacteria in the ocean that were causing the emissions of CO2 and climate change. And boy, not climate change, but just the increase in emissions. Every denier website in the world had that article posted up within one day. It was a hoax. It was a complete hoax. No such thing. And that's, so you, we grab, we, we aggregate, we bring facts to us that support our belief. Our beliefs don't change when they're strongly held, when there's facts. So giving facts to people about climate change doesn't really win the day. And so this one here, this other ball is bigger. This sphere is bigger. It's not us. It's the carbon that goes up in the atmosphere every year. OK. This is how much is going up and staying up. OK. So but again, as you pull back, and here we are, OK, and you know, it's like, not very much, is it? And so when I've gone, whoops, it's gone. OK, but when I've shown those two spheres to people in C-suites and asked them, I said, do you think we can do this? There's us. There's our little sphere. There's the carbon sphere. Do you think this is doable? Can we actually get to a solution to this? And they said, well, yeah. Because when you see it in that scale, it looks very doable. When you are buffeted by fear and data and facts that don't even make sense and, you know, and lingo and jargon and, and you know, gigatons and megajoules, you go, whoa, I'm out of here. And, and that's what we've done, right? So, yeah. So we're just a speck on the earth altogether. It's a pinprick on the earth, all of humanity. It's an astonishing thing what we've done and what we can do. So what we need now is, and this has been spoken of before, what we need is narratives. We need stories. It's not facts. We have the facts. We have the science. We need that too. And the stories that will make the difference. And it's the only way we're going to expand this movement towards addressing climate disruption. So Drawdown started for me in, in 2001, and I, at that time, read the third assessment, and, and, and it was serious, not as serious as the fourth one or the fifth one. They keep getting more serious. And I uh, then turned to NGOs and friends and said, what are we going to do, and, and do we have a list? Do, do we know how to you know, address this? And I kept, they said, no, not really. And I said, well, let's make a list you know, of the 100 most substantive solutions to climate change. And, and some people said, that's a great idea. And, and, but they didn't do it, and they wouldn't do it. And I kept asking for years, and then I finally dropped it. And over those years, what came out, of course, is these incredible suggestions about how to solve climate change. One new three megawatt 
nuclear power plant every week for 25 years. That would take care of address some of it. Okay, there's one. Uh, we're going to take coal, make it hydrogen fuel, take the carbon, uh, liquefy it, and pump it into salt mines in Ohio, and hope it doesn't it never comes out again for a non-existent hydrogen infrastructure for non-existent hydrogen fuel cell cars that really didn't uh, were just on the drawing board at that time. That was the solution. The solution I was the most uh, enamored with in some ways uh, was uh, metallic particles, you know, just putting up everywhere in the atmosphere. Yes, it would be a little darker on Earth, but, you know, <laughs> the, the, the plants would adjust. But as a, as a father of, of, of daughters, I have daughters, you know, we used to call that glitter. And, <laughs> and I knew when they came out with this, the wand from the wall with a star on it and glitter in the hair that they were fairies that day, you know. Because they had glitter on, Papa, this is, I'm a fairy, you know, and they're covered with, you know, this. And I was saying, this is a solution to climate change, right? So this thinking, <laughs> this thinking about solutions has come from, and I want to be really white males, and God bless them, I'm one of them. But the fact is that white males say, oh, we have a big problem. We need really, really, really big solutions. And so nuclear and will solarize the world and, and wind turbines and you know it's just like this idea and they focused on very very important solutions in terms of solar and wind right but the fact is you can't get there from here with them and you cannot not get there I mean either way you need them but you can't get there from here with solar and wind and Tesla electric cars and building efficiency. It is not sufficient unto the day and so it's why I wanted to see this list of solutions. I want to know, can we achieve something that we weren't naming? And we were saying, well, two degrees and 450, stabilization. That's not the goal. The goal is drawdown. It's the only goal that makes sense for humanity. And drawdown, <laughs> drawdown is the, year to, the, the reduction on a year-to-year basis of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. What else is there to do? That's the only thing. We don't want to. Two degrees is a measure. It's not a goal. You know, Bill McKibben was asked the best headline that could come out of Paris talks. He said, we're halfway there. <laughs> it's a four-degree summit. It's better than Copenhagen, which is, you know, six degrees. But hey, you know, it's not a goal. That's a scientific measurement. So what we do at Drawdown is, well, what happened was that I met Amanda Joy Ravenhill. She's here uh, somewhere. Uh, just a brilliant millennial activist, teacher, uh, expert in, in, in biochar. And we decided to do it ourselves. Not, not ourselves, but to coalesce Drawdown, because nobody else was doing it. And so that's what Project Drawdown is. And what it is, a list of the 100 most substantive solutions to climate change. And it, it's just astonishing to me that since 1988, when Jim Hansen testified, when the IPCC was organized and created, no list has ever been made. I'm telling you, no list of existing solutions that are the most substantive has ever been made. Find them. You can't. It's astonishing. I, I, I can't even explain it. I sound like an idiot when I say it. Like, oh, Paul, you didn't read the, you know, it's there, it's been there all along. You know. And I have read it, and it just doesn't exist. So that's what we're doing. And to do it, we need people, and we need a coalition, and we can't do it. And this is not a book by Paul Hawken or Amanda, or you know, it's a book about, about what we can do. And so we gathered, we in, we have a coalition of a couple hundred people, organizations, agencies, governments, NGOs, businesses. And with uh, our, our, our uh, research director, Chad Frischman, has then gone out to the world and gathered fellows who are working on these solutions. And what we do, we measure the carbon impact they're having now. We measure the financial impact. And we then scale it over 30 years and say, what would the impact be if these solutions scaled in a rigorous, a reasonably rigorous way? Kind of pants not on fire, but maybe smoking. In other words, that, that, we've got to, that it matters. These solutions matter. And all of them are scaling anyway. They all are scaling. So, so um, these are 
the fellows, the Drawdown Fellows. And they come from Australia and Bangladesh, um, Canadian, they're Chinese, they're Iranian, Colombian, Danish, Dutch, Filipino, Ghanaian, Indian, Indonesian, Nigerian, Spanish, I mean, they come from all over the world. And they're the most beautiful, fantastic people. And, it, you know, their CVs at 26, you know, I, at 26, my CV looked like a piece of Kleenex. I mean, they're just amazing what these people know, have studied their multiple degrees, what they've done, and they're working for a pittance to create the solutions, to create the, the measuring, their mapping, and their modeling these solutions. And we haven't released the data yet because it's tentative. It has a three-step review process, and we have uh, uh, advisors who, are some who have not given us any advice because we haven't asked for it yet, but their advice has to do when we come out with these hundred solutions and, and the data and the, the write-ups, and they include Mike Brune, who was here yesterday, Sierra Club, Bianca Cole, amazing guy, Janine Benyus, Carrie Kennedy, Lynn Lear, John Wick, who's here, Rachel Gutter, uh, um, who's with the, the Green Schools Program at USGBC, Linnell Cameron from Autodesk, Elizabeth Colbert, who's written just so beautifully in The New Yorker uh, about climate change, uh, Dan Kamen, IPCC lead author, University of California, Berkeley, May Bove and, and, and Bill McKibben um, uh, at 350.org. Uh, uh, Governor Martin O'Malley, who is uh, going to continue to come in third in the debates. Uh, and so maybe he'll, his time will be freed up soon for us. David Orr, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's just such a good man, but you know, <laughs> this is time to tell the truth and, and, and Bernie's got it going. And, um, <laughs> Although I'd have to say, you know, I'm not sure he holds a candle to Kenny Ossible. I mean, that's a guy, that's a, if, if Bernie's elected, I think Kenny should write the State of the Union speech for Bernie and so, so forth. You know. but, but what we, you know, what I saw really and what precipitated Amanda and I to do this was that in, in 2012, um, uh, Bill's article came out, The Terrifying New Math on Climate Change. And it was absolutely terrifying, and it was new, and it was uh, math. It, it was true to its word, uh, absolutely. And it was based on Mark Campanelli's work in London called Carbon Tracker. And when he was the one who pointed out that the uh, coal, oil, and gas companies have 750 billion tons of reserves that they have not drilled or extracted or mined, and that you burn one third of them and it's game over, game over. And yet they're going out, wanting to go out like Shell into the Arctic and drill for more oil and you know explore for more reserves when the reserves they have cannot be burned or unburnable carbon as it's known and so forth. And so what Mark said is Bill turned his data into poetry. And that poetry just went around the world, even though Justin Bieber was on the cover of Rolling Stone that week. And, and, uh, but the problem was that it also, it really did terrify people. And I had friends, activists, you know, who I know and respect so much that said, oh, it's game over, game over. I'm just gonna go to the Squamish Valley and raise my family. Or, I don't know what to do. Really, it, there was people who just felt so defeated about it. And this is what I mean about changing our story. I mean, if, if, if our story is we're screwed, it just absolutely destroys imagination, innovation, creativity. It, 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 it does. And, and what we found when we did the 100 most substantive solutions is that there's so many surprises in there. How about educating girls in the developing world? Yeah. Ah. Hello. When's the last time you saw that on a list of climate solutions? But it's like, hey, reproductive rights? Hmm, that's, that's a, what an idea. I mean, and, and not just reproductive rights, but giving them the ability and the capacity to transform their lives and the lives of those around them, including their children and their daughter, right? That is uh, one of the most substantive solutions as well, and clean cook stoves. And so the solutions themselves are really quite interesting. And what we're finding is that the data are surprising. It is, I literally, you could take 
10 climatologists or scientists and so forth, and you say, well, write down the top 10 solutions to climate change, and, and if you had asked me to do it too, I would have got it wrong, and they will all get it wrong. The solutions are different. And the people here actually do understand that. There are people here who really understand this. And uh, John Wick, the Marin Carbon Project, amazing project. And, and they have funded his foundation or has funded some science uh, that's coming out in a, a year, a couple of years and so forth on global circulation models that will actually change a whole way of looking at our relationship to the earth and how we treat the earth. Brett Byers is here with the Rainforest a Trust. Okay, Brett and Richard Houghton from, uh, uh, are doing a paper that's going to be published. Same thing. It will reimagine what the rainforest can do for us. I mean, and they have data. And like we say, you know, in Goddess we trust all others bring data. And, and, and so they're bringing data and they're publishing and it's peer reviewed and it will reimagine for you and us what it is that we can do that we're not screwed. That we're screwed if we believe it and we think it and we act that way. That's the only screw job going on right now. Really, it's in our minds. Give it up, let it go. Because, uh, and then you have, you have uh, Claire Dakin here from Tree Sister. Go check her out. I mean, get out of here. And it's so interesting, it just, coins, it just complements ex Brett, what Brett's doing exactly, but it comes from the wisdom of the feminine. It comes from a different point of, not point of view, but it comes from a different vector meeting in this, uh, in, in the land. These are, by the way, um, see, those are the, some of the solutions, most of them actually. Um, and I suppose I could stop and let you read for a while, but I probably won't. Um, they're on our website, drawdown.org. Um, but the solutions that I want you to look at are is the next page. And these are land use solutions. And the land use is the surprise that we did not see coming at Drawdown. We try not to have a bias. We just do the math. We do the math. We do the math. And these are the top land use solutions. And um, again, who knew? Really, you know, we work with Eric Tonsma at Yale and Ryan Hottle at Ohio State. And what we know is that um, this works. This really works. Do you know what this is? Huh? Stomata, exactly. This is, if you pick a handful of leaves up, there's 100 million stomata in your hands, OK? I mean, these, we are just beginning to understand how brilliant the stomata are in the leaves. They, 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 they are just, they love CO2, OK? That's what they're, that, that one's open on the, you know? and it wants CO2. But the thing is, when stomata are open, they release you know, moisture. So they have this amazing sort of calculus to when to open and when to close and when to receive and when to give it up. And it's just uh, astonishing. And computers have tried to model or mimic the calculations that a leaf is doing, that a stomata is doing, and it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. They have memory, it's time of day, it's heat, it's wind, it's moisture in the air, it's moisture in their root system being communicated up to the stomata and their concentrations of gas. And out of that, they're growing <laughs> and making sugar, right? It, this is, these are our allies. This, this, we, it, it, Kenny said it, it's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. You better believe it. It's just extraordinary. And we just found out there's three trillion trees alone on the planet. And, and each of those, there is over, you know, can be over uh, 500 billion to a trillion stomata. I mean, this is how it works. And that is, it's only really three things we can do. We can stop emitting carbon. We can do it by efficiency or changing our energy sources and we can bring it back down home. So it's not about decarbonization, it's about recarbonization. So, um, and, and Binaries has been the leader in this, the people here understand that. Uh, it's, um, it, it, this is really the heart of that understanding. 
Um, Mark Twain said that a man is never more truthful than when he acknowledges himself as a liar. And, um, Oh, so true, and, and, and I know for me, growing up, is that we live in a lying country. Our country lies every time, all the time, and we've lied to ourselves. You know, we lie to others anywhere in the world who will listen to us. We have been lied about climate change. We lie to Native Americans without compunction. We lie to African Americans. We lie to the victims of our reckless, senseless wars. We lie to our children. We lie to Muslims. We lie to Christians. We lie to the poor. We just lie all the time. And deceit and dishonesty are actually departments in virtually every corporation in the world. They're called corporate communications, right? And they work with, they work with the lawyers and so forth. You know? but, but however important it is to speak truth to power, we don't change people by telling them they're liars. It doesn't really work. We change people when we create the opportunity, when we can show them that there is a beautiful truth that they can move to. Right? And that's, that's what drawdown, that's what drawdown's about. It's not that we know the truth. We do not, and so forth. We are an organization working together as a coalition to hold a mirror up to the world, a mirror up to humanity, to showing humanity that it does know what to do, that it does, that it is doing it, um, that we as people deeply care that our compassion is endless and our ingenuity is boundless. I mean, this is true. And that our willingness to work on behalf of people we will never meet or know, so forth, is extraordinary. And that we are full of grace and compassion and humor, right, and talent. And so Drawdown is not a plan. It's not a proposal. It's not meant to be the way. It is a reflection back to ourselves what we already know and what we're doing. And we have to see ourselves, and we have to stop seeing ourselves the way the media is projecting onto us, okay? So the last question, I'm not really good at applause lines. I really thank you for that one. Um, I, the last question I want to ask you comes straight from Byron Katie, an amazing bodhisattva woman, teacher, friend. And that is, I, you have to ask yourself, please ask yourself this question. And that is, is climate change happening to you or for you? Think about it. It's just a prepositional difference. To you or for you? Because if it's happening to you, then you're a victim. You're an object. You're disempowered. You got the short end of the stick. It wasn't fair. I was born at the wrong time. My parents failed. <laughs> Whatever. What a place to, to, to dwell in. It's a horrible place. If it's happening for you, it means this. First of all, I take 100% responsibility for everything that the mind that created this was the mind of duality. And if I go around pointing fingers and blaming others, then I am that same mind, right? <laughs> and that if it's for you, then what happens in terms of innovation, creativity, you know, invention, imagination, it just explodes. And that's the world we live in now. And that's what's happening. This is happening for us. This is the gift in, and Claire Dacon will say this, in our fears is the gift, is the gift. Of course we're afraid of it. The end of civilization, not cool, right? <laughs> but th therein lies a life of such rich and extraordinary meaning that I feel like I'm talking to the converted. You, you're living it, you embody it, and I thank you for that so much. Bye-bye.